हेलो एवरीवन दिस इज डॉक्टर विशाल त्रिवेदी फ्रॉम डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ बायो साइंसेज एंड बायो इंजीनियरिंग आई आई टी गुवाहाटी एंड इन द कोर्स मॉलिकुलर बायोलॉजी वी आर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द डिफरेंट आस्पेक्ट्स सो इन दिस करंट मॉड्यूल वी वर डिस्कसिंग अबाउट द पॉलीमर चेंज रिएक्शन एंड इफ यू रिकॉल इन द प्रीवियस टू लेक्चर्स वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट द पॉलीमर चेन रिएक्शन वी हैव डिस्कस अबाउट दी हाउ द पी सी आर कैन बी इवॉल्ड फ्रॉम द वेरी क्रूड यू नो थर्मल साइकलर टू द वेरी वेरी Uh, refined and sophisticated machines and how you can be able to design the or perform the pcr so we have discussed about the primer designing we discuss about the how you can be able to isolate the dna rna and all that and how you can be able to perform the pcr and then at the end when you are done with the pcr you can be able to analyze the pcr also now in today's lecture we are going to discuss about the real time pcr and the real time pcr is a slight variant of the traditional pcr what we have discussed so far and uh, it has an additional advantage as well so in the current uh, in this particular lecture we will discuss about the real time pcr and how you can be able to perform the pcr into the your laboratory so for the first question comes uh, what is the real time pcr and what is the uh, you know advantage of uh, real time pcr so the first question comes what is the real time pcr and uh, uh, what is the advantage of real time pcr compared to the normal pcr so the real time pcr as the, as the name suggest is actually a pcr where you are going to do the amplification cycles and at the same time you are also going to monitor the product so a uh, real time pcr actually combines the amplification of the target dna and its detection in the single step that is it collects the data throughout the amplification in a real time okay remember that when we were talking about the polymerase chain reactions we were having the four different steps so we were having the denaturations annealing uh, and then extension and then uh, that cycle continues so after at the uh, after at the end of every cycle you are supposed to Uh, you know in the in the traditional pcr you will not be able to uh, you know know what is the amount of dna is being produced whereas in the real time pcr you are actually going to see what will be the uh, amount of product is being developed so real time pcr combines the amplification of the gene of interest that is the you know traditional pcr what we are doing also with the intensity of the fluorescence so this intensity of the fluorescence is directly proportional to the product what is being formed remember that when we were talking about a traditional pcr we are saying that it is you know we are going to run the 25 cycle 35 cycles and so on so after end of every cycle it is going to tell you what will be the amount of fluorescence and uh, you can easily correlate that fluorescence to the amount of product what is being formed the moment at which the target amplification is observed first mainly define the reactions the time period at which the fluorescence intensity exceed the background fluorescence intensity is called as the cycle threshold or ct values as a result a large amount of target dna the fluorescence signal will appear more quickly resulting into the lower ct values the uh, the people sometimes people are not saying the real time pcr they are also using the different words such as the kinetic chain pcr or the quantitative pcr quantitative pcr is also been called as q pcr okay so uh, there is there is a slight difference between the traditional pcr versus the real time pcr in a traditional pcr the real, you are not been able to you are only going to know the end product okay uh, that means after every 25 cycles what will be the amount of dna is been produced whereas in this case uh, you are actually going to see the amplification after every cycle and that's why you it is actually going to give you the uh, real life uh, you know real time uh, monitoring of the product now the question comes what will be the advantage of using the real time pcr so why there is a real time pcr preferred over the fundamental pcr okay so the first option is it's going to be a quantitative analysis which means the real time pcr is going to allow for the quantitative measurement of the uh, 
DNA or the RNA what is present in the sample and it is actually going to provide the quantitative results. This means it is actually going to tell you okay, 10 microgram of DNA is being produced after first cycle, 10 cycle, fourth cycle like that. Uh, number 2 is uh, the speed. Okay. So, real time PCR provide the result in a real time, hence provide result in a short duration of time. Fundamental PCR requires a post reaction analysis which can be time consuming and uh, uh, so in a fundamental PCR uh, you are actually going to you know um, uh, run the uh, product onto a uh, agro gel and then you are actually going to uh, you know do the uh, you know trans simulator and then you are going to observe the DNA. Whereas, in this case it is actually going to give you the real time PCR uh, you know uh, information about what is the product being formed. Number 3 uh, the real time PCR it is more sensitive. So, real time PCR is more sensitive and can detect the low copy number of target DNA due to the continuous monitoring of the sample. The fundamental PCR is less sensitive because it is actually going to give you the end product. Uh, number 4 uh, real time PCR is reduced contamination risk. So, the closed tube system of the real time PCR reduces the contamination risk due to the minimum post PCR handling. It is the main concern with the fundamental PCR. Then data accuracy. Uh, since this is quantitative, the data is going to be more accurate. So, real time PCR provides the precise and the accurate data throughout the quantification of the frozen signal. Uh, fundamental PCR is more susceptible to the variation because it depends upon the uh, you know when you are going to run the DNA onto the agarose gel uh, depending upon the, the many factors uh, your quantitative quantitation could be wrong. Uh, number 6, uh, it is high throughput, right? So, real time PCR can be easily automated for high throughput applications, making it suitable for the large scale testing. Remember that the real time PCR people were using very, you know, uh, often uh, in the case of COVID testing, right? Because of this feature only that you can actually be able to, you know, do like 50 samples, 100 samples, 2000 samples, and so on, because it is, it can be automated with the help of the high throughput things. And number 7, uh, you can actually do a multiplexing. So, real time PCR enable the simultaneous detection of the multiple target in a single reaction, which is very, very difficult to done to do with the traditional PCR. So, because of these 7 advantages, uh, people are doing the real time PCR because it is giving you more information about your biological samples than the uh, traditional PCR. Now, what is the principle of the real time PCR? So, the principle of real time PCR is to quantitatively measure the amount of specific DNA or RNA target in a sample by continuously monitoring the amplification process in a real time fluorescence. This technique leverage the natural ability of DNA to produce a fluorescent signal when it is uh, amplified. There are two common methods which are being used. One is cybergreen dye method, another one is called as Tachman uh, probe method. So, the cybergreen method, uh, in this uh, method, a fluorescent dye such as cybergreen is added to the PCR reaction mixture. Cybergreen binds to any double standard DNA and this generates during the process. Uh, as the DNA uh, target amplifies, more double standard DNA is produced, leading to an increase in fluorescence. This rise in fluorescence is directly proportional to the amount of target DNA. However, it is important to design the specific primer to ensure that the fluorescence signal correspond to the specific target. So, this is exactly what is going to happen, right? When you are doing a PCR reaction, you are going to do the denaturation, you are going to do the annealing of the piece, uh, primers, then you are going to do the extensions and after every cycle, you are actually going to have the more amount of double standard DNA, right? Remember that after if you start with the one amount, one DNA molecule, right? Then after first cycle you are going to have, so after first cycle you are going to have two copy of DNA, then ag again you are going to have four copy of DNA and so on. And as the amount of DNA is going to increase, it is actually going to bind the cybergreen, okay? So, cybergreen is a dye which actually goes and binds to the double standard DNA. 
So as soon as you have the one amount of DNA, its cyber green is going to give you the X fluorescence. If the two DNA molecules are being formed, then the two molecules of cyber green is going to bind and that is why you are going to get the 2 X fluorescence and you are going to get 4 X fluorescence and so on. And that is why you are actually going to get the, uh, the fluorescence signal proportional to the amount of DNA. Okay? And uh, that is what it is going to happen. right? So, once you are going to do the DNA synthesis, after DNA synthesis you are going to have the two, amount, two strand of DNA and the cyber green is actually going to intercalate into the DNA stuck DNAs and it is going to give you the fluorescence. So, uh, this is the first method. The second method is the Tachman method, Tachman probe method. Okay? So, Tachman probe method is more advanced method. So, in this method apply a specific uh, sequence specific fluorescent probe like Tachman probe that is designed to bind the target DNA. When the probe binds to the target uh, during the DNA synthesis, the DNA polymerase cleaves the probe releasing its fluorescent reporter. The increase in fluorescence is directly proportional to the amplification of the target sequence. This method offer high specificity because the probe only th uh, probe only fluorescence when it is bind to the intended targets. The real time PCR instrument set a predefined fluorescence threshold and the cycle at which the fluorescence signal surpasses the threshold that is recorded as the cycle threshold or the CT values and the CT value is very very important. right? So, in a Tachman method what you are going to do is you are going to do uh, annealing. So, when you are going to do annealing the uh, your Tachman probe is actually going to go and bind and when there will be a polymerization and the strand displacement what will happen is that this fluorescent dye is actually going to be cleaved by the DNA polymerase and it is actually going to be released into the signal released into the solution and that is actually going to be detected by the detection system and it is actually going to be proportional to the amount of DNA what is being synthesized. And this is exactly what you are going to go right you are going to see uh, the you know the increase in the fluorescent signal and then it reaches to the threshold right and then it actually goes and reaches to the saturation so when it reaches to the saturation then it is actually going to uh, called as the cycle threshold or the ct value so this is actually going to be ct values right uh, and uh, so this is going to be the maximum fluorescence what it is actually going to achieve right and the ct value is inversely proportional to the amount of target dna rna in the sample like the lower value ct values indicate a higher concentration of the target sample this means uh, when it reaches to this uh, threshold uh, values uh, it is actually going to reach this point if you are going to have the, uh, so it, it takes uh, 10 cycles, it can take 15 cycles, it can give 30 cycles. So, more number of cycles it reaches and crosses the threshold cycle, threshold values that means that the, the lower the concentration of the R DNA or RNA was present in your sample. So, it is inversely proportional to the amount of DNA, then the amount of time it is going to take to reach to the threshold values. There is specialized software which process the um, you know which process the uh, fluorescent data to calculate the CT value and a standard curve is generated using the unknown concentration of the reference DNA and RNA. This is standard curve enables the determination of the initial amount of the target sequence in the sample. Now, uh, if you want to perform the uh, real time PCR, you require a set of reagents, you require the set of uh, uh, machines and so on. So, let us see what are the things you required. You require a thermal cycler right? and this thermal cycler is different than the thermal cycler what we were using for the traditional PCR because this thermal cycler should have a detector detection system so that it can be able to detect the fluorescence. right? So, you require a uh, thermal cycler and you also require a fluorescent measurement um, uh, system so that it uh, and you can integrate that into the machine so that while it is amplifying the reactions it can also detect either the cyber green method or the Tachman probe method. 
then you require the DNA or RNA as a template right. Mostly people use the RNA as a template because uh, that RNA is the most uh, desirable thing what you can do, but you can also do the DNA also and the target or DNA which can you want to um, quantify or amplify. Then you require the primers, you require the forward and the reverse primers, you require the enzymes. So, you require the two different enzymes, you require the DNA polymerase and you also require the reverse transcriptase. So, DNA polymerase is responsible for the synthesis of new DNA strand uh, during the PCR. So, it is exactly the same as what we were using for the traditional PCR. And then you also require the reverse transcriptase. So, you can use to, to quantify that RNA which is done by converting the RNA into cDNA and before the process of amplifications. Then you require the fluorescent dye. So, either a fluorescent dye that binds to the double standard DNA like cyberglene or you can use a specific fluorescent probe that binds to the target DNA generating a signal during amplification that means you, you can use the Tachman probe method. Then you require the detection system. So, you require the real time uh, detection system. So, this system requires the fluorescent uh, measurements during PCR cycle commonly cyber green or the Tachman detection systems are used. So, in many of the time what happen is that this real time detection system and the thermal cyclers are actually going to be integrated into each other and that is why it is going to be called as real time PCR machine. And then you also require the PCR tubes or the plates. Now, before moving into how you are going to perform the real time PCR, you also should understand how the reverse transcriptase is going to work, right. So, reverse transcriptase are like RNA dependent DNA polymerase. So, it is exactly the reverse what the RNA polymerase is doing. So, RNA polymerase is doing the RNA synthesis from the DNA, reverse transcriptase is doing the DNA synthesis from the RNA falls into the category of polymerase enzyme which helps in the generation of cDNA taking RNA as a sample. Reverse transcriptase can perform three activities. It can perform the RNA dependent DNA polymerase that uses the single standard DNA as a RNA as a, as a template to generate the cDNA. It can do the RNAs H endonuclease activity. So, it can degrade the RNA strands of DNA RNA hybrids and it can do the DNA dependent DNA polymerase. So, converting the single standard RNA probe into a double standard DNA. All these molecular techniques such as real time PCR, RTQ PCR, cloning of cDNA, RNA sequencing frequently uses the reverse transcriptase as it requires uh, conversion of RNA into DNA. So, reverse transcriptase has two activities polymerase chain active, active site and endonuclease active site. And it is actually going to have the three different types of enzymatic activity RNA dependent DNA polymerase, um, RNAs H endonuclease and the DNA dependent DNA polymerase. And uh, exactly this is what it is going to do, it is going to take up your single standard RNA molecules, then it is actually going to do the polymerization reactions. So, uh, when the reverse transcriptase is going to work. Uh, it is going to use the you know the it is going to synthesize the DNA and it is going to produce a RNA DNA hybrid and you know that our reverse transcriptase is also going to have the RNA's H activity. So, it is actually going to degrade the RNA part. So, it is going to degrade the RNA from the this RNA DNA hybrid and leaving the single standard DNA template. And then this single standard DNA template is also going to be converted into double standard activity by the DNA dependent DNA polymerase activity. And at the end what you are going to do is you are going to get a double standard DNA template from the single standard RNA template ok. And this double standard RNA template is going to be called as the cDNA or the complementary DNA. There are many more methods through which you can be able to prepare the cDNA. But most of the people use the reverse transcriptase because it is easy and it is straightforward. Now, once you prepare the cDNA, right, you can be able to perform the real time PCR. So, there are steps which are involved into the real time PCR. So, like, uh, you are going to have the first step that is the sample preparation. Sample preparation means you are going to denature the cells. Suppose you started with the cell or you are started with the uh, fluid or whatever. So, you are going to crush the cells, you are going to denature the uh, and you are going to extract the 
RNA or DNA whatever the target uh, molecule you want to quantify and then you are going to extract the DNA or the RNA. If you are going to extract the DNA then it is directly going to get into this reactions. If you are going to start with the RNA then it is actually going to have the additional step of converting the DNA into RNA into DNA with the help of the uh, reverse transcriptase. Then you are going to have the primer and the probe designing. So, it is going to you are going to design the primers and uh, probe and all that and then you are going to set up the reactions. So, you are going to set up the RD, real time PCR reactions where you are going to have the template DNA or cDNA you are going to have the cyber green, you are going to have all other kinds of uh, you know the reagents what you are going to add then you are going to set up the amplification cycles, you are going to do the flow send monitoring and then you are going to have the threshold detections and then ultimately you are going to do the data analysis. Now, each step in each step like for example, in the step number 1 you are going to have the sample preparation. So, you are going to extract and purify the RNA or the DNA whichever the molecule you want to uh, you know isolate or detect from the biological sample both quantify and quality are important factor for the accurate results. So, you are actually going to isolate the DNA and RNA then you are going to check the quality of the molecule you by running it on to the agarose gel. So, in the case of DNA you are going to run the regular the agarose in the case of RNA you are going to run the denaturating agarose gel. Once that part is done and you have cleared the QC part it is called as you know you are going to uh, uh, pass the quality control then you are going to have the primers and the probe designing. So, the primers are designed that will bind to the region complementary to the target sequence probes are also designed which are highly specific for the target regions and the primers and probes play an important role in the quantification of the sample. So, once you are done with this you are going to set up the reactions and you are going to prepare the PCR reactions that will contain the cDNA template. Uh, some cases if you are isolating the DNA then you are going to have the DNA then you are going to put the forward and the reverse primers you are going to put the fluorescent probes or the dye then you are going to put the DNA polymerase, reverse transcriptase, buffer solutions and DNTPs and then you are going to set up the amplification cycles. So, amplification cycle more or less remain the same as what we have discussed for the regular PCR that you are going to have the denaturations, then you are going to have annealing, then you are going to have extensions and so on and this will continue after the extension it will again go for denaturation and so on. So, exactly the same as what we have discussed for the traditional PCR. And then it is going to have the flow send monitoring. So, you are going to have the real time PCR. So, that is you do not need any kind of steps to be done that will eventually be done by the machine and it is going to measure the intensity of the cyber green method or the intensity of the uh, uh, flow send dye from the Tachman probe method. And then you are going to have the threshold uh, detections. So, the, a predefined threshold level of flow send is set. The, and that is actually being done by the experience ok. So, you will know that what will be the threshold values for this particular gene product or so. The cycle at which the fluorescent uh, surpasses the threshold level is recorded as the cycle threshold or the CT values and the CT value is inversely proportional to the initial concentration of the sample which means if the CT values are low then your concentration of molecule is concentration of molecule is high is very high because then that is how you are reaching to the CT value at very very low uh, cycle number. Then you also have the sixth number that is the data analysis. So, there are softwares available which detect the flow send signal and generate a standard curve which used as a reference which used as a reference DNA RNA concentration which allow the determine the initial concentration of the sample. And now, once you are done with all these you can actually going to get the fluorescent data right the pattern how you are going to your how the fluorescent signal is moving into this and then you can actually be able to do the data analysis. So, analysis of real time PCR. So, in real time PCR the most common graph method is the amplification plot which usually represent the accumulation of PCR product over the course of reaction. So, this is what it is you are going to get 
after in on this side on the x axis you are going to have the cycle on the y axis you are going to have the fluorescence and then it's going to have the multiple phases like the initial phase you are going to have the baseline then you are going to have the threshold values then you are going to have the plateau so in the x axis represent the pcr cycle or the time each pcr cycle involves the denaturation annealing and extensions y axis represent the cycle uh, fluorescence cycle detection by the instruments right and uh, then you are going to have the amplification curve. So, each sample or target gene is represented by the specific curve on the graph. These curves show how the fluorescent signal in increases over cycle. A steeper slow, uh, slope indicate a higher amount of target DNA. So, this pattern of this slope is also going to give you an idea what could be the amount of DNA present, right? Because if the pattern is sharp, even if it is slowly moving, then you are actually having the very low concentration of the target DNA. If it is the moving very fast or steep, uh, then basically it is uh, you know uh, your uh, amount of DNA is very high. So, amplification curve has three phases, the initial phase, then you are going to have exponential phase and you are going to have the plateau. So, in the initial phase, it represents the early phase of the cycle, PCR cycle, not enough amplification of cDNA to produce a significant amount of probe. The cycle just started with denaturation of double standard DNA to separate the single standard DNA. So, in the initial phase, it is just going to prepare the machine or prepare the system for uh, uh, starting of amplifications. Then in the exponential phase, there will be a, you know, there will be a, uh, amplifications and every after every cycle, it is going to be double, right. So, in the exponential phase, the fluorescence signal increases with each cycle and it is going to be double after every cycle. So, from uh, it forms a well defined sigmoidal curve which indicates that the PCR reaction is proceeding efficiently. Then the, during this phase, the CT value is typically at the middle of the phase which is used to determine or quantify the initial concentration of the target DNA. The slope should be steeper which tells the efficiency of the reaction while the linearity of the slope represents the doubling of the uh, amount of DNA. Then you have the plateau phase, at this page the system is going to get saturated and you are going to get the plateau. So the plateau represents the point where the majority of the target DNA has been amplified. The curve loses its linearity since it is not the suitable for precise quantification of DNA. And then you have the threshold line, typically set the level where above the threshold uh, baseline fluorescence. The cycle at which the each curve crosses its threshold is called as the cycle quantification or the cycle threshold. The lower the QC value, uh, higher the initial amount of target DNA. As it is known that CT value is inversely proportional to the initial concentration of graph, from the graph it can be concluded that the CT1 is smaller than the CT2. That means the DNA concentration in a small sample 1 is bigger than the DNA concentration in the sample 2, right? And that is what you are going to do the analysis. And based on that analysis only, you are going to say which gene or which gene product or which sample has more amount of DNA and less amount of or less amount of DNA. So, you can actually be able to compare the two samples. So, this is all about the theoretical aspects of the real time PCR, what we are going to do and what we have actually understood that uh, what are the different steps you can be able to perform, what are the requirements and how you can be able to perform. Now, if you want to do the real time PCR in your laboratory, you also need a uh, experimental uh, feedback, you also require the practical uh, demos so that you can be able to understand how it can be performed. So, in the if you see the steps, uh, first step is how you are going to prepare the sample, right? So, in the first step, uh, you are going to denature the cells and you are actually going to prepare the RNA, right? And uh, we have prepared a small demo clip so that you can be able to get acquainted how you can be able to isolate the RNA. Remember that in the past we have discussed about the RNA isolations whether it is using the uh, polity uh, affinity chromatography or whether we have used the uh, other methods. 
So, uh, we have prepared a small demo clip and it is actually going to explain you how you can be able to prepare the RNA from the sample. Hello everyone, uh, in this video I will be discussing uh, how to isolate RNA from the clinical samples. So first step is to add the triazole in the uh, samples. So this uh, triazole that I have already added in it, uh, this triazole contains 40% of phenol, uh, guanidine thiocyanate, uh, ammonium thiocyanate and uh, sodium acetate buffer. So after the after the addition of uh, triazole, we will add 200 microliter of chloroformate. So I have added the uh, chloroform in it, then I will gently mix the solution. So until it turns milky. So after that I will centrifuge it at uh, 4 degrees Celsius for 15 minutes at uh, 13,000 RPM. Uh, now the uh, centrifuge step is done, uh, we will collect this upper transparent layer uh, from it and without touching the middle interface layer and transfer it to a new tube. Then we will add uh, equal volume of isopropanol into this. then gently mix the tube by just simply inverting it. Now we just uh, incubate this tube uh, at the room temperature for 15 to 20 minutes. Uh, now the incubation is done. Uh, uh, we will just uh, centrifuge it for 15 minutes at uh, 4 degrees Celsius at 13,000 RPM. Uh, now after the centrifugation uh, we will just uh, discard the uh, discard the supernatant and wash the pellet with 70% of ethanol uh, as the rna quantity is very low we can't see this pellet so we'll just blindly uh, add the 70% ethanol and just try to detach it from the from the bottom We just mix it two three times. Now, after the mixing, we will again centrifuge it for five minutes at eight thousand RPM at four degrees Celsius. Now we will just uh, discard the supernatant and let the RNA pellet dry out and let the uh, ethanol to evaporate in for 5-10 minutes. Now as you can see this uh, ethanol is completely evaporated. Now we will just resuspend the RNA pellet into the uh, new PSP water. Here I am just resuspending it in 20 microliter. I am mixing it with a pipette so that all this uh, RNA get diluted in this. Awesome. Uh, now we just uh, incubate this uh, RNA samples uh, at 60 degrees Celsius for 10 minutes. Now after this heating we just quick chills the RNA with ice 
for five minutes. Uh, now the RNA isolation step is done. We can just quantify the RNA, how much RNA uh, we have uh, just uh, isolated, and then we can just use for this uh, like for cDNA preparation. So now you have understood how you can be able to isolate the RNA from the uh, your samples, right? Once you isolated the RNA, you are actually going to set up the reactions, right? And uh, we are not getting into the detail of primer and probe designing because that we have already discussed when we were discussing about the traditional PCR. So primer designing is exactly the same, but once you have isolated the RNA, your second part would be that it is get converted into cDNA, right? Because you are not going to put the RNA into the reactions, you are going to put the cDNA into reaction and that will be your second part, right? So that also we have prepared a small demo clip where the students are going to show you how you can be able to convert the RNA into the CNA and you are going to set up the reactions. Now uh, as the RNA solution is done, in this video I will be showing you how to prepare the cDNA from the RNA. Now for that we need, uh, uh, I have uh, prepared, uh, I will be preparing a 10 microliter of reaction and in 10 microliter I will be adding uh, 1 microliter of random primers to prepare the cDNA. This is a random hexamer that I will be using for this. Uh, for the cDNA preparation, everything should be at high. Should be nice. Okay. And after the primer, I will add one microliter of DNTP. I have 10x uh, real uh, 10x reverse transcript stage buffer. So for the 20 microliter of reaction, I will be adding 2 microliter. Now 5 microliter is water. Now we just uh, short spin the tips. <coughs> uh, next steps. Next step is to add the RNA that we have isolated. So for the cDNA preparation, we uh, the total uh, the total volume of the reaction will be 20 microliter, and out of which 10 will be the, all the buffers like uh, a random hexamer, uh, DNTP uh, buffer, RT buffer, or uh, this uh, reverse transcriptase enzymes and water. And other uh, other 10 microliter will be uh, RNA, as we are using one one nanogram of RNA to prepare the cDNA. So I uh, just uh, I have. This is the RNA. So I am using 3.2 microliter of RNA because I have quantified the RNA that we have isolated, and for one nanogram of RNA, we will need uh, 3.5 uh, microliter of RNA. Much of RNA into the reaction and making the volume 20 microliter. the reaction mixture is done, we will just uh, set it up in, in the PCR. Uh, now we will just start the PCR reaction. Uh, as you can see, this is the standard uh, PCR cycles. First is 10 minutes for uh, at 25 degrees Celsius. Next is incubation or extension uh, time for 2 hours at 37 degrees Celsius. And finally, we will just 
inactivate the whole reaction at 85 degree for 5 minutes you just confirm the volume all the confirm the steps you keep the tube in the PCR now verify the block and you just start the reaction Uh, now as you can see it will take 2 hours and 15 minutes to complete the reaction and after that uh, our cDNA is prepared. Now once you have prepared the cDNA you are going to set up the reactions. So you are going to put the cDNA into the reactions right you are going to uh, set up the RT-PCR reactions you are going to set the amplification cycles you are going to uh, see how the fluorescent monitoring is working or not and you are also going to set up the threshold detections right. And uh, these steps also we have prepared a demo clip so that you can be able to get familiarized with the how you can be able to uh, perform the uh, uh, real time PCRs and how you can be able to set up the reactions once you have the cDNA. In this video I will be showing you uh, how to do the real time PCR of just of the cDNA that we have uh, recently prepared. So my targets will be gap DH and uh, some uh, yeah, virus primers like in this case I am using NDV N primer so, uh, for, uh, so all the reactions I will be doing in the triplicates so as you can see these are the tubes uh, for the real time PCR and I am using uh, three tubes three sets for a single sample so this is the sample and I will be amplifying with the uh, cyber green uh, so for a 10 microliter of reaction I will be requiring a 5 microliter of cyber okay. So I am going to add 5 microliter in each tube. One microliter of uh, PCR. Oh, sorry, primer. Each primer. So I'm going to use one microliter of primer in each of the tube. Uh, this is cap gauge. Um, this is a virus primer. So I am going to compare this uh, the amplification of viral RNA with the internal control of the MDH. Okay. Uh, we will add 3 microliter of water to make the whole reaction up to 9 microliter. I have added uh, 9 microliter of uh, buffer uh, which, which contains uh, cyber green, primer and water. Now the most crucial step is to add the cDNA which is 1 microliter. So uh, in 1 microliter of my cDNA I will be adding 5 nanogram of cDNA. So to uh, by adding equal amount of cDNA which is 1, nano, 1 nanogram, 5 nanogram sorry into each well. I will be ensuring we have equal amount of RNA so that we can compare if uh, uh, we can compare the virus modulation or virus replication inside the samples. Now the reaction mixture is complete. So I will just 
close the lid. You can see this is the key. Just spin it up, spin. Uh, now the reaction is set up. We'll just put the, these tubes in the uh, real-time machine. Uh, now we just set up the reaction of real-time. Uh, this is the Quant Studio uh, real-time machine, and uh, we will just uh, set up complete run. Okay. We will just uh, fill up the data. Uh, create new experiment. Just name the experiment. Test one. The system is the block type. Uh, we are calculating comparative C value, C T value, and we have used. Cyber green for the amplification. Just click next. Uh, this is the this is the PCR cycle. The total volume will be 10 microliter. As you can see, this is the hold stage. Uh, 15 degrees Celsius for two minutes, then 95 degrees Celsius uh, for 10 minutes. Step two and final PCR stage or amplification stage. It will uh, be at uh, 95 degrees Celsius for 15 seconds and 60 degrees Celsius. For one minute and this complete cycle will be done for the 40 40 times the final step is melting curve which is 95 degrees celsius for 15 seconds and just 60 uh, degrees celsius for one minute and final is uh, 95 degrees celsius for one second this is the dissociation step so this is the complete run complete cycle uh, okay let's we'll just click next uh, we do the advanced setup uh, as you can see, as I've already discussed, uh, I have two different targets. First is uh, gap DH, and next is NDV, NDVN, and we have only sem uh, we have only one sample. So this is test sample. So, uh, test sample. We just uh, tell the machine or tell the software that. Uh, which well we have used so i have placed my tubes in the sixth uh, lane so all these things are uh, these six things are test sample first three are for gap dh and next three are ndv we will just hit next word uh, we will just see if there is something in the machine it will show here the run number so this is the run number I uh, will just click this, I uh, will save here, uh, now the reaction is started, so it will take uh, around 96 minutes to complete. So this is the amplification plot, this is the number of cycles that we have put from, as you can see this uh, 0 to 40 cycles and this is the uh, reaction. Uh, threshold here. Uh, from here, we'll see uh, if uh, our uh, this sample are getting a targeting hit, targeted hits or not. So these are the samples. Now it will take 96 minutes to complete. Uh, now this is it for the real time PCR. Uh, so after this uh, 96 minutes, we'll just get the uh, CT values. Uh, for that, uh, after that, we can just compare the gap DH and the NDV and CT values and see if there is an amplification of NDV and gene or not. That's it for the video. Now, uh, we have un what we have discussed so far, we have discussed about how you can be able to prepare the RNA, 
once you prepare the RNA, how you can be able to generate the cDNA from the RNA and then how from the cDNA how you are going to take the cDNA and put it into the RT-PCR reactions, how you are going to set up the RT-PCR reactions, how you are going to set up the amplification cycles, how you are going to monitor the fluorescence and threshold. Now, once you are done with the threshold detections, you are going to get the data actually okay, and you are going to get the fluorescent data. Now, at the last step you are actually going to do the data analysis right and data analysis to so that you can be able to calculate the CT values, you can be able to know what is the number of cycles in which you have crossed the CT values and so on. So, that also we have prepared a small demo clips which will actually going to explain where the students is actually going to explain how you can be able to compare the expression level of the two different genes from a particular two different samples. So, in this uh, analysis they have taken the gap DPH as the uh, as the housekeeping genes and it is not going to change from one sample to another sample. So, that is actually going to be used for uh, you know for the background corrections or for equalizing the two samples. And then they have also tested the other other gene for as a experimental purposes. So this is the analysis part. So as I said, at the end of the PCR reaction, we'll get a CT value, and then we have to compare how the expression of that gene is modulating due to the virus infection. So uh, you can see I have already arranged the data. This is these are my samples mock. These are treated, or we can say virus infected. And these are the repeat samples for second gene. So one gene I'm having a gap DH as a normalizing control, and second I'm having a p53 gene. So in this case, we want to see how this p53 gene is getting modulated due to a virus infection. So suppose if I'm having a control sample, and the second one I'm infecting the cells with the virus. So some proteins will go down regulated, some protein will go up regulated. So we want to see what is exactly happening to this p53 at the mRNA level. Okay, so these are the CT value and the method that we are going to follow for to calculate the fold change is this one. Analysis of related gene, uh, the method name is delta raised to the power, sorry, 2 raised to power minus delta delta CT method. So you can read this paper about the analysis. This paper is having almost 1,60,000 citations. So uh, you can see, you can take a photo of that paper as well if you want or you can write the title analysis of relative gene expression data using real time quantitative PCR and that this method. Okay. So, in this method to calculate the fold chain we need to calculate this 2 raised to the power delta delta CT. So, in a minute I will tell what exactly this is. So, as I said we have a CT value. So, you can see the CT value is 19.7, 19.365, 20.459. 20 so, in all the three cases, this is almost similar. So, we will calculate a mean CT value. Average of these three values. So, this will copy and we will calculate the CT value for each for all the cases. Now, we have a mean CT value say 19.8 this 25.8 then we have to calculate a delta ct now this is mean ct value okay now we will calculate delta ct difference of ct value so which difference so in a single sample we have two genes gap dh and a p53 gene and we have two ct value so we will calculate the difference between these two so for every difference will have a two value this one and this one. So, first I will use the uh, value of control this minus this value. Now, we have a delta ct. Similarly, we will calculate the delta ct for the treated samples. So, this is delta ct. Now, we will calculate delta delta ct. Delta delta ct is now uh, we are using as I said we are using gap th as a normalizing control. So, suppose I am giving an infection and some of the protein as I said is going down regulated. So, the cells will probably die. So, the number of gap DH mRNA in all the cells will be different. So, we want to normalize the expression of all the proteins using a gap DH. So, see this gap DH is in this case it is 19.8. 
but in the infected one it is 25.8 so you can guess in which of the cells the gap ditch expression is more obviously 19.8 but we want to normalize it so in if we are getting the value of gap ditch is 19.8 value 19.8 in this case 353 is 25 but in the infected one the gap ditch is 25.8 and this is 29.5 so we can't say if the virus is getting the, the due to the virus infection the value of p53 is down regulating or up regulating can you guess it no we can't say for sure because in both the cases the gap dh is different suppose we are getting a same same gap dh here in 90 sorry so in both the cases we are getting 19.8 value for gap dh and then we are having the p53 at 25 and then 29 then when we can clearly say because of this virus infection the p53 is going up or down not up regulated down regulated because the ct value is increasing so it is down regulating but in this case we are not having a similar gap dh it is slightly increased so the gap dh is also less okay so we need to normalize this value to the this value so we can compare the the expression of p53 so this is normalization first is calculating the delta ct then we will calculate the delta delta ct in delta delta ct we will normalize by subtracting this value with this value only okay so i will repeat it again the delta ct is the difference between the mean ct value of two genes from the same sample okay difference between the means mean ct of two genes from the same sample okay so we calculated the difference between here this is and this delta delta ct is normalization basically so we are going to normalize this value with this only so we are going to uh, that's why i am subtracting the same value but in this case we are not going to normalize we are going to simply use uh, subtracting this value with the test one so here we have minus 1.6 now the fold change is as i said the method is del 2 raised to the power delta delta ct now as you can see we got our delta delta ct so we'll raise the power 2 raised to the power minus of delta delta ct so you can see fold change is one which means we have successfully normalized the gap dh value because it's coming one but we have to calculate the fold change for this so you can see it is coming three so which is which means that in, in if we are normalizing the value in the mock treated the the expression that we have normalized is one but in the treated one it is three times so it is up regulating the gene the p53 gene but initially when we saw the value we could see that 25 or 29 we could see that we the value was getting increase because of this gap we actually we could able to see uh, this is not decreasing the expression is higher as compared to this one okay so this is how you plot a graph so in the mock one mock mock control you will have value 1 and in the treated one you can see this is 3 so suppose if i am changing the value and uh, decreasing the value this suppose i have 22 so will, this is 21 and this is 22.5 so you can see this is how this value is increasing now this is 655 times of the one and say if i am decreasing this value say 35 this is also 35 and this is 35 34.5 so you can see now this value is 0.08 which which means the virus down regulated the gene okay so do you have any uh, doubt so this is the analysis part now as sir was mentioning about the covid 19 or say like uh, you generally went to suppose you went to a doctor and you gave your sample for the testing like if you are covid positive or not so what will he do like he will collect the samples and will run the pcr and at the end it will he will get he or she will get a ct value now as i said we are setting up 40 reactions so out of 40 reaction at which cycle we are getting the amplification in this case 25 in this case 90 so suppose if you are covid positive then you will get a ct value lesser than 40 so suppose you are getting 40 uh, value of 35 and my friend suppose i am getting a value of 35 and my friend is getting a value of 29 so the doctor will say that guy is 
more infected with the virus because the CT value is less and I am lesser in, less infected. So this is just telling by the CT value if you are infected or not. But if you want to see how the gene is getting modulated to the infection, so we can we can do this method and we can at the end we will get us this a full change and you can plot and you can just simply publish your data whatever you are getting at the end. Okay, so this is uh, experiment number one. So we have to, as I said, this is a quantitative data. So we have to repeat the same experiment with biological replicates, and at the end we will get a threefold change. Suppose in this case, as I said, we are getting a full change of 3.08. In the next experiment, we will get something around three. In the next one, suppose we are getting 2.5. So we will take a, a average of all the three experiments, and then we can do the statistical analysis. And then, then we can see our data. Uh, we can say that our data is significant, and this is the final value. Okay, so this is the analysis part. So, you, if you have any doubt, you can ask now. Housekeeping changes. Okay, so if you don't have a doubt, we can end this session. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so this is the analysis part. So as I mentioned in my earlier session that at the end of the PCR action, we will get a CT value. So these are the CT value that we got and uh, this, this is the mob control and the CT values are these 19.7, 19.6 and this is a virus infected sample. So I am using two genes. A gap DH as a normalizing control and my target gene, a P53 gene. So in the analysis, we are going to see like uh, after infection what is happening to the P53 gene expression. It is upregulated or downregulated due to the virus infection. So the method that we are going to follow is this method: uh, analysis of relative gene expression data using uh, two raised to the power minus delta delta CT method. Okay. So you can take a picture if you want of this paper and read it thoroughly. So at the end of this analysis, we will be calculating this value. So I will be explaining this, what exactly is delta delta CT is. Okay, so now we have a CT value. So you all know what the CT value is already. So we can see, see that we have three values. So for that we need to calculate the delta delta CT. So for, first we will calculate the mean CT value of all the values. So first we will calculate the average. This is the average. I will copy, cut, copy and paste it here. So this is the average of P53 gene. Then we will calculate this. Now this is mean CT value. After that, we will calculate the delta CT value. Delta CT value means difference of CT value. So if you want to see the expression of P53 gene, we want to uh, first we have to normalize the expression because you can see that in the first case our CT value is 19 in gap DH and in the preceding one the, it is 25. So can you guess like in which of the cases the expression of gap DH is more? In the first one. So uh, but in, obviously this is very much high so the expression is less because because of virus infection. So if you want to if you want to see the expression of P53 gene what exactly is happening with the P53 gene we have to normalize it with the gap DH. The word normalization means like can you guess like this is the, the CT value is 25, around 25. In, in this case, the CT value is 35. I think I think these are the values. So these are the values. So can you guess which are the in which of the cases the expression of P53 gene is more? In the first one. Now you, you are guessing just because of these values. But normal but normalization means means like first we have to normalize with a single gene. Like in this case, the gap DH is different. But if it, the gap DH is 19 or 20, in that case we can say that the P53 expression is same. But due to the difference between the CT value in these two things, we can't say like the expression is more in which case. Okay, so we have to normalize or we have to cancel out the difference between these two values of gap DH of both the samples. Okay, so we have mean CT value as we, we have calculated. Then we have to calculate the delta CT value. Delta CT value, as I said, is a difference between the CT. That which difference? The 19 and this 25. 
so we will calculate the difference so first I will uh, take uh, 19 minus this value now this is delta ct value similarly we will calculate a uh, second ct delta ct for for my three, uh, infected samples now this is delta ct then we have to calculate delta delta ct which means difference of delta ct value now we have how many delta ct values we have two so we have to normalize it this one so first as i said we will be normalizing the value of expression so we have what we have to do we have to subtract the this value this with this one only because this is control sample and we want to normalize which we want we want to see what exactly is happening in this case so we make the value of p53 expression as 1 in this case and then we will calculate the full chain in this case are you getting my point or you are simply saying yes repeat yes ok so first we calculated the ct value ok then after the ct value we, we, we calculated delta ct difference between the ct value now that you can write the definition of ct value delta ct delta ct is difference between the CT value of two genes from the same sample. Difference between the CT value of two genes within the same sample. So this is delta CT. Difference between this value of P53 and gap DH from the mock treated. And in this in the other case, difference between the CT value of P53 with the gap DH in the treated one. Next, we have to calculate the delta delta CT. So as I said, we are going to normalize the expression of P53 as 1. So for that we need to subtract the same value with the, this same value only. This value with the same value. So the delta CT value will be 0. In the next case, now we are going to see the expression. So for that we need to normalize with the first one. So we will subtract the value of delta CT with the mock treated one. Okay. So the delta ct is, now you can write the definition of delta delta ct, it's the difference of delta ct value between two samples. Okay, between the two samples. In this case, as we are normalizing, so we subtract it with the same value. But in this case, we are not normalizing, we are calculating the, we are checking the regulation. So that's why we are subtracting with the control one. Now the fold change. So as you can see from the paper, this is, 2 raised to the power minus delta delta ct. Now that we got this delta delta ct, we will calculate the fold change. So what the fold change is? 2 raised to the power minus of this value. Okay. So the fold change is 1. Why we are getting the fold change as 1? Because we normalized it to 1. Okay. So if you calculate the fold change for treated 1, we are getting 3.408. So in the initially, initially you were saying the expression is more in this case, in the control one, but after analysis what we got, the expression is more in the infected one. So for graph, the mock treated one will be 1 and the treatment will be 3.08. So what we got at the end, the virus infection is increasing the expression of P53 by 3 fold. Okay. So this is uh, the expression. Now, as I as sir mentioned earlier, like we generally prefer the real time machine for the uh, detection method. Like if you remember, you if you can recall this thing, like you went to a doctor and you got your real time PCR if you are COVID positive or not. So what he did, what he or she did, he or she uh, took your samples from your cheeks, then they did the real time PCR and at the end they got the CT value. Now the CT value that they got was ranging from uh, was lying between from 1 to 40 because we are running the reaction for 40 cycles so suppose i am getting the ct value of 35 and my friend is getting a value of 32 or 30 so which of us are having more infection 32 obviously but if you want to analyze the expression of a particular gene in both the cases then we have to use the gap dh and this is the analysis method and then this is how you calculate fold chain and you can plot a graph and then publish it. So this is a replicate first. We have to uh, again do the same experiment biological replicate and at the end we will get a similar value. Then we can uh, take the average and see uh, how significant our data is then you can publish it. Okay. Do you have any doubt?
we are isolating the mrna from the cells then, then we are reverse transcribing it to the cdna yeah. and we are using that cdna as a template in this reaction yes, we are sir. not isolating it for the no, no, no. no we are not removing anything no. this is on cd first application this okay so after the end of the analysis you could have understood that how you can be able to perform the real time pcr you are going to prepare the samples preparations you are going to isolate the rna you are going to prepare the cdna then you are going to put the cdna into the reaction mixtures you are going to put the uh, you are going to set up the amplification cycles all these depends on the uh, type of uh, products you want to develop and then from that you are going to get the data and then that data is actually going to be analyzed uh, thoroughly so that you can be able to know which protein or which gene is being amplified or it's actually uh, you know uh, showing the lower expression so this is all about the real time pcr uh, we have this what we have discussed we have discussed about the basic principle why we are using the real time pcr what is the advantage of using the real time pcr and so on and at the end we have also discussed about the experimental aspects so we have prepared we have shown you the couple of demo videos how you can be able to perform the real time pcr in your laboratory so with this i would like to conclude my lecture here in our subsequent lecture we are going to discuss some more aspects of molecular biology thank you mm -hmm.